Praise God. It's good to be in the house, Lord. Can we just thank this worship team? They've been back and forth today, up and down, but just leading us. Praise God. Well, on behalf of the pastoral staff, I just want to say thank you for your prayers. Thank you uh, for your support. I consider it just a privilege uh, to be able to, to pastor here at the church. It's funny, my mom, uh, my mom usually texts me on Sunday morning and she just you know, lets me know she's thinking about me, praying for me. Uh, but I'm all, I often remember as a child waking up early on Sunday morning and I would come to the living room and I'd see my dad there just over his message getting ready to, to preach and preparing for that. And man, I think back to that. I think what a privilege that we get to do what we do, to open the word of God and share the word of God. And uh, it's a blessing uh, to do this here at Grace Point. Heard a lot of horror stories through the years about congregation members and elders and all this stuff, but I thank God that's not the case here. You guys are a blessing to our lives, and so thank you for that. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can pull them out. Uh, If you have your note sheet, pull it out. We're going to jump into Romans chapter 9. If you like controversy, this is your passage, okay? Um, So pray for me as we dig into this. you may have noticed it was a little backed up in the parking lot. That was a preacher's fault from first service. I may have bit off a little more than I can chew. Uh, so pray with me as we uh, jump into this. Also because uh, my son-in-law is on the front row with a Dolphins jersey and I got to preach. Pray for me. God's good. That's grace. There's grace in this church. Amen. All right, let me warn you as, as we uh, get into this passage today, uh, that this, again, this is one of the most controversial passages in, in, I think, at all of Scripture, honestly. If you just look up uh, debates on Romans chapter 9, you'll find a lot of debates out there. And usually the debates are over this. It, it's, it's what question you ask first. Sometimes we approach the Word of God and we see something, we read something, and we say, how can it be so? And so we can take the Word of God and twist it to means something else, or we can approach the Word of God and we just say, what does the Word of God say? Amen? And so as we're coming to this passage today, it focuses on the sovereignty of God, and I'm, I'm praying that by the time I'm done sharing today, that you will be more able to trust in a God who does not fail, to be able to trust in a God who is sovereign. Now, in order to understand what Paul is, is writing here in, in chapter 9, there are some theological concepts that we're going to have to wrestle with. And we're going to look at a very important doctrine of the church today. It is the doctrine of divine election, divine election. And and our focus, again, on the study of God's word must be, first of all, what does the Bible say? Because I I believe this, I don't know about you, but I believe the word of God to be true. I I believe it to be true, and I, I believe today that theology matters. You know, there are some who say, why do we need to be so heady? Or why do we need to be uh, so theological? Christianity is a matter of the heart. But theology matters because before something can get into your heart, you have to understand it in your mind. Are you with me today? Theology matters because before something can get into your heart, you have to understand it in your mind. And Christianity is a, a thinking faith. It is a, a reasoning faith. I hope you don't check your mind at the door when you come here on a Sunday morning. I hope instead you have this desire to learn, amen? Because there are so many truths in the word of God that if they really got into our heads and they they got into our hearts, it would transform the way that we live. And and scripture does not call us to be transformed by the renewing of our heart. It is by the renewing of our mind that we're changed, right? And so before we jump into chapter nine, I want you to understand the, the context in which Paul is writing these words. Remember, this is a letter written by Paul to the believers in Rome And in the original letter, there were no chapter and verse designations, okay? So when we come to a new chapter, we should not assume it's a completely new thought. The way that Paul writes this letter, one thing is building upon another. And there are three questions that uh, chapter 9 raises that we've probably all asked at one point or another. They ask this, has God's word failed? Is God faithful? And is God fair? Has God's word failed is God faithful and is God fair? Three questions. They, they deal with God's power, his promises, and his plan. And we're going to see all of that in this passage over these next two weeks. Now, the end of chapter 8 gave us a sequence that I want to draw your attention back to. This is often known as the golden chain of salvation. It's, it's very important to understand because it gives us a, a clear order in which God saves individuals. And what is clearly seen in this chain is that salvation is a work of God from start to finish. He who began the work is faithful to complete it. And so it's not that, that God initiates the work of salvation in our lives and then we complete it by our obedience. That's not how it works, okay? Yes, our service to God is important. In fact, 
I believe our service to God is preparation for eternity, but that service does not earn us eternity, okay? God and God alone is responsible for our salvation. He starts the work and he finishes the work. And so look at this golden chain. It's in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew. The first thing that God does is he foreknows his people. When Paul says God foreknows us, he's speaking of, of God's knowledge of us as persons. God's foreknowing involves a decision to enter into a relationship with you and I. It's a decision to set his love upon us. And it is because of this choice that he makes that you and I believe. Jesus said, John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. There's nothing in the text of Romans chapter 8 to infer that the knowledge that is spoken of there is in regards to something about the decisions we will make in the future. I, I do not believe this refers to God looking down the corridors of time and foreknowing the decision we will make in regards to salvation. He's not making a decision based on our decision because if that was the case, we would ultimately be in control and he wouldn't, right? R.C. Sproul in his book on Romans put it this way. We could reasonably translate this text, Romans 8, 28, those whom he foreloved, those whom he knew in a personal, intimate, redemptive sense from all eternity, he predestined. Those he foreknew, he predestined. Having set his affection on us, God predestined us to what? To be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That means that our our destiny is that we will bear the image of Jesus Christ. Now, the third link in the golden chain or the chain of salvation is calling, right? And those he predestined, he also called. Theologically, we need to understand there are actually two calls. There's an external call, but there's also the internal call. The external call is the gospel call. There was a group that went to Staten Island Friday night and they they shared the gospel, right? They preached the gospel. There was an external call that went out. It is a call to respond to the grace of God. But we know this about that external call. It can be resisted, right? Because not everyone responds to the preaching of the gospel. When the gospel is preached, some resist. But the internal call is different. It's it's more than just an external invitation. It is a work of the Holy Spirit where God prepares the hearts of the elect to respond to the gospel message. Remember, the elect of God are those whom God has predestined to salvation. The internal call is an effectual call, meaning it is effective. God's internal call always accomplishes God's intended purpose of drawing men and women to himself. This is the call that is there in verse 30. This is what verse 30 is describing. How do we know that? Well, we're told, told those he called, he also justified, right? And so obviously the calling is effectual if it leads to justification. We're told it does that, right? So justification is the fourth link in the golden chain. And very simply, it is this act of declaring or making us righteous in God's sight. Believers in Christ are declared righteous not because of works of righteousness in them, but rather it is by the imputed righteousness of Christ, which is received by faith alone. Martin Luther called it an alien righteousness. He says it's a righteousness that is extra nos. In other words, it is apart from me. It, it's not inherently my righteousness. It belongs to Christ, and he places that righteousness upon me. And so it is faith that saves us. But hear me, that does not mean that we can assume that we produce the faith required to justify us. Even that faith, Scripture says, is a work of God. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. What is not your own doing? The faith. It is the gift of God. You see that? Even the faith to believe is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What Paul is clearly saying is that saving faith is a sovereign and gracious gift of God. It is according to his plan. It's not given because we deserve it. It is given graciously. And the fifth and final link in the golden chain is glorification. One day, God will remove us from the presence of sin. How many of you are looking forward to that day? He's gonna remove us from the presence of sin, and he's gonna place us in this eternal state of glory. We will, at that point, be fully known by him as we fully know him. But remember verse 30, it used that word glorified. Paul speaks there as if it's in the past tense. He, 
speaks as if it's already done, right? Because as my wife shared two weeks ago, you and I can consider it done. We have the assurance, again, that he who began the work is faithful to complete it. Now, I wanted to walk you through that golden chain of salvation to help you understand this morning that salvation is entirely a work of God. Like when you look at all these verbs, God is the one doing every single verb. He foreknows, he predestines, he calls, he justifies, he glorifies. Those he foreknew, he does all of the other things that result in their glorification. And, and because of this, there is absolutely nothing that can separate you and I from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Like if he does all the work, then there is nothing that can separate us. Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me. So understand, this is the context, this is the understanding we need to have as we come to chapter 9. It's right after this great crescendo crescendo that nothing, right, absolutely nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul says there in verse 1, are you with me? Are you there? Chapter 9, verse 1, he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. It makes you wonder, did someone accuse him of lying, right? What's, What's going on here? Well, remember the context because the context matters. You see, as soon as Paul makes these statements at the end of chapter 8 that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, he knows that objections will be raised. He knows there are those who would say, well, well, what about the Jews, right? Paul, if if what you're saying is true, and yet the vast majority of the Jewish population at that time was rejecting the message, Paul, what's going on, right? Paul, don't you care about the Jewish people? Don't you care about your people? And Paul says, well, I want you to know, first of all, that I care. And here's how much he cares. Look at this. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's stating this so emphatically because many did not believe him. If you remember from the book of Acts, whenever Paul would enter a city, he would always go to the synagogue first. And as he's teaching in the synagogue, he was so often attacked by his fellow Jews And so he's making it clear here that he's misunderstood. You see, the truth is he would walk into those synagogues, he would engage engage in conversation with his fellow Jews because he was so eager for them to see what he saw. It is really love that drives him. It's love that caused him great sorrow. You see, as we go through the book of Romans, you need to understand these are more than just theological ideas to Paul. His heart is in this, right? His heart is moved. For those who have not yet responded to the gospel, I pray it's the same for you. Pray it's the same for us as a church, amen, that our hearts would be moved for those who have not responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes as far as to say he wishes he was accursed. He was cut off from Christ for his fellow Jews. And he says this, he says, as he says this, he's really following the pattern of Moses. Moses asked God that he would blot him out of the book, right, if he wouldn't forgive the Jewish nation. And of course, Jesus was the ultimate example of one who became a curse in our place so that we would have life. Yet Jesus is the only one who could do that because he was without sin. Moses and Paul, they're telling us, well, I would do it if I was able. (laughs) You see, the reality is we should all be blotted out. The reality is we should all be accursed. But Christ had such love for us that he did what no one else could do. And then Paul describes the benefits of the Israelites here. He says, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. I think Paul was a, a very proud Jew. He was, he was proud of his Jewish nationality, right? He says God adopted them. They, they got to see the glory of God. They received the covenant, the law, the sacred scriptures. They received so many promises through the prophets and, and through the patriarchs. And one of the greatest blessings was that it was through the nation of Israel that the Messiah would come. And he makes it very clear here that this Messiah, Jesus, is God over all. This is a short time after Jesus' death. And understand this, believers already know that Jesus is God, that he's one with the Father. But looking at the state of Israel, the believing Jew in that time might look at his kinsmen and say, well, it seems like, at least from my perspective, like God's word is failing. 
It seems like the promise to the Jewish people is failing. And so the question is, has God turned his back on his people? Listen, that's an important question to ask, okay? Because if you believe that God somehow turned his back on his people, the Israelites, then what gives you any hope that he won't do the same to you? And so Paul really answers this question there in verse 6. His answer is going to continue uh, through verse 11. But verse 6 kind of forms his thesis statement, if you will. Look at what he writes. He says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. It is not as though God's word has failed. Paul is basically saying, don't look at the experience of Israel the way you see it here and now, and try to gauge whether God's promise has failed. Listen, we could ask the same question here, right? We live in Rockland County. I'm often driving around in Rockland County and seeing the Jewish people around the county. You say, God, what's going on, right? I mean, you, you came to them. They're, they're your people. They're, they're your chosen people. Why are they not responding to you as Messiah? What is happening, right? But really, the, the, the purpose, God had a purpose when he, when he chose the nation of Israel. And, and the purpose was that they would be a light to the nations, And so really this passage we're looking at focuses more on the election of individuals to salvation than it does on the nation of Israel. Because Paul's going to go on later in chapter 10, verse 9, to say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 11, that same chapter, for the scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. But I want you to understand what the church was wrestling with at that time. Because if the gospel goes to the Jew first, and only then can it go to the Gentile, does that mean that Israel is under God's curse because they're not receiving the Messiah the way so many had hoped, right? Does this mean that God rejected his people, or... Is this a part of God's larger redemptive plan of bringing the Gentiles, bringing the nations to faith? And so Paul is going to introduce us here uh, to this subject. It's a subject of God's purpose in election. What is his purpose in choosing who he chooses? He's going to talk about God's sovereignty in the election of individuals. Remember, election is the act of God whereby in eternity past he chooses those who will be saved. And then the question becomes, well, is that election, is it conditional or is it unconditional? Is it conditional? Is it based on something that he sees in us or is it unconditional? Meaning all in regards to his sovereign choice. Now, one of the reasons I I think we push back somewhat on this idea of God's sovereign choice is because we don't like the idea that we're not in control, right? Like not just as Americans, but as New Yorkers, man, we get stuff done, right? I, I got this. Don't worry. I'll take care of it, right? I got it, right? I see I did it. I did it my way, right? One of the reasons we struggle, hear me, with the sovereignty of God is because I think we live with this thinking that we're sovereign, right? Nobody tells me what I can do and what I can't do. And so you have to realize that there's just this natural pushback on the idea that God saves whom he chooses to save. We would never say it out loud, but we think that part of the reason we're a part of the elect is because, well, we were just smarter than everyone else. And so we just kind of figured this out, right? Well, I received Jesus in my heart because I was more godly than my neighbor and because I was sensitive to the gospel and and they weren't. Why did I come to Christ and he didn't or she didn't? Well, there was something in me that that I have that he didn't have. And, And so our thinking, at least in some way, is that our standing before God is at least in part because of something that we have done. Now, again, you'd probably never say that openly, but that's what our culture has taught us, that we get what we deserve. But hear me, the heart of the gospel goes against what our culture says. The heart of the gospel says, thank God that we don't get what we deserve, right? Thank God we don't get what we deserve. And so there's, there's often this pushback on this idea of election because somewhere deep down we feel uh, we're more deserving maybe than someone else. But the other reason that people push back on this idea is they feel like, well, they have to protect God. They have to protect God's reputation because if election means that salvation is based on God's choosing, then I worry that God doesn't look good when he sends anyone to hell. But this doctrine of election forces us to say that God is sovereign and that he will be right in whatever he does, whether I like it or not. Again, it is not as though God's word has failed. You see, the gospel that Paul proclaimed made clear that many Jews would not be included in God's promised blessing and that many of the Gentiles actually would. 
The word failed there means to fall out of or to fall down or to drop. God's word will never hit the ground. It also means that God's word will never fall powerless. And really that's the main point of the entire chapter. No matter how disappointed we may be, God's word has not failed nor will it ever fail. Amen? Numbers 23, 19 puts it this way. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Isaiah 55, 11, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Jesus himself stated very strongly, John 10, 35, that scripture cannot be broken. Listen, God's word will not and cannot fail. Let me say that again, because some of you missed it. God's word will not and cannot fail. But then that raises two very important questions. Does that mean that God is free to do whatever he wants to do? And if so, is God fair in the way that he treats people? But I want to remind you, before we ask the question, how can this be, we need to ask, what does the Bible say? And so Paul's examples are going to come from uh, some Old Testament characters, because he's He's assuming that his readers are familiar with these characters. Again, he he says there, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. So look at this, because Paul gives us the answer right away regarding the possibility of God's word failing. And he really answers it in three different ways to show us that spiritual Israel is only a part of physical Israel. And the truth is, there has always been a smaller remnant inside the larger group. Okay? It's the same in the church today. There is a smaller remnant inside the larger group. But the reality is that God's promise was never meant to be realized in the entire nation of Israel, but only in the elect Israel within Israel. Now, look at his points here. He says, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all are children of Abraham. Why? Because it's not the natural children who are God's children. Remember, Paul said it earlier, remember, going all the way back to Romans chapter 2, verse 28, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, right? Nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of what? Of the heart, (laughs) by the spirit, not by the letter. Remember, most Jews in that time thought that they were in, man, we're in just because of our ethnicity. But Paul's saying there's only a portion of larger Israel that is spiritual Israel. And so he reminds us in this passage that Abraham was the father of both Ishmael and Isaac, right? But only one of those sons, Isaac, was the son of the promise, right? In other words, one child was chosen and the other was passed over by God. Now, some will explain this by saying, well, of course God chose Isaac because Isaac was the son of Abraham and Sarah. I mean, Ishmael was the son of Abraham and Sarah's servant, Hagar, right? Of course, Ishmael's not of the promise. And so what does Paul do at this point? He moves on from talking about two half-brothers. He says, now let's talk about two twin brothers, okay? And we see God's sovereign choice over Jacob and Esau, verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, listen, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I don't know how familiar you are this morning with the relationship between Jacob and Esau, but I want to point out just, just a few things. We, we know that Abraham's son Isaac married Rebekah, right? And when she became pregnant, she realized that she had twins. And even before the twins were born, they were wrestling. They were fighting in the womb, right? They're fighting it out, right? It's kind of hard to break up a fight in the womb. I don't know how you deal with that. But Rebecca's like, what is going on, right? And, and so she asked the Lord, what's happening? And, and here's the response. Genesis 25, 23, God says this to her. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided, One shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. 
So again, it's before the children are born, and yet we see God choosing the younger one. Now, naturally, the older one is preferred, but God chooses the younger. Another way we could describe election is to select out from a number or to pick out. And truth be told, God could have just as easily chosen Esau over Jacob. Again, naturally, that would make more sense, but God chose Jacob. Now, why? Was it because of anything good in him? Listen, if you think Jacob was a good man, you've got to go back and read his story, right? <laughs> Because before he encountered God, he was a deceiver. Well, did God look down the corridors of time and and see some good in Jacob that made him choose him and not Esau? All we have to do is to go back to verse 11 to see that's not the case. It says, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad. Well, yeah, this was before they were born, but later on, God would see some good. God saw that good down the road. No, no, no. God is not choosing Jacob because of anything that he has done. Verse 11 goes on to tell us why he did this, right? He says, in order that, in other words, here's the reason that God's purpose of election might continue not because of works, but because of him who calls. Let me say that again, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It doesn't get much clearer than that. See, I think part of the reason we struggle with election, part of the reason we don't understand this is because we still think we're the center of the story. We still think it's about us and it's about our glory. But God's eternal purposes always promote his glory. Hear me, God's eternal purposes always promote his glory, even if we don't understand what he's doing. But but what about that verse? You saw it, verse 13. Like, what's up with that, right? Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. He's quoting from Malachi 1.3. That verse always gets people's attention. Now, in its original context, the context uh, of of Malachi, God is explaining why he chose the nation of Israel and why he crushed the Edomites, who are descendants of Esau. And, And really, the distinction that Malachi is making is really the dichotomy of the fate of Israel and the fate of Edom, the the fate of Jacob and the fate of Esau. Jacob, God loved to the point of choosing and saving Esau. On the other hand, he clearly passed over. The point is that God is sovereign in his choosing between two twins. But that's a tough thing to swallow, right? Like honestly, we, we wrestle, we should wrestle with that, right? Especially that statement, Esau, I hate it. But hear me today, I, I believe that when we understand our own sinful nature and we understand the mercy of God that has been extended to us while we were sinners, uh, I, we won't wrestle with Esau, I hated. No, instead we'll wrestle more with the statement, Jacob, I loved. <laughs> I mean, again, Jacob was a schemer. He was a scoundrel. He despised his birthright. He treated God with indifference, but God did the choosing before he was born. And so the real question is not why God overlooked or rejected Esau. The real question is why in the world did he choose Jacob? He elected to show mercy to a deceiver, Jacob, even though that deceiver deserved justice. You see, what Esau received was simply was what was coming to him. And had it not been for the mercy of God, Jacob would have been passed over as well. And we need to understand this morning, church, we are all born objects of God's wrath. Ephesians 2, 3, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature, hear me, we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That was our lot. And hear me, it is only, it is only because of God's choosing that we receive mercy. No one in this room this morning deserves salvation. See, if you got what you deserved, if I got what I deserved, we'd all be on our way to hell, right? Strict fairness would mean hell for us. And so if we want fairness and we approach this text and say, well, I'm looking at that, but that's not fair. If we demand fairness, and yet we know that we've sinned against the holy God, if we demand fairness, I just want what's coming to me. I just want what I deserve, no more and no less, then we are all essentially demanding hell. Because justice is not the way of salvation for us. Remember Paul's discussion regarding the law, all the way back in Romans chapter 3, right? We were there a while ago. Verse three, verse, uh, Romans chapter 3, there in, in verse 9, what then, are we Jews any better off? Right? He says, not at all, for we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, 
so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Look at that. The whole world accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Listen to me, church. Our sin deserves condemnation. And so justice is not our need. Mercy is. And it is simply a miracle of God that he saves anyone because none of us deserve it. If you're saved today, you need to know this. You don't deserve it. God did not choose you because of your good looks. Oh, you're all dressed up. It's Sunday morning. You look good. It's got nothing to do with it. Your religious background, nothing to do with it. Your education, your your intellect, it doesn't matter at all to God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, it is only because of God's free grace and his mercy. It's nothing else. It's God's choosing. God is sovereign. (laughs) Pastor Vody Balkum often says it this way, God is God, he's not running for God. God is God, he's not running for God. In other words, he's sovereign. And because of that, he can do whatever he wills. God is God, and we are not. Think about that for a moment. Some of you, I, I know this this morning. You struggle with this idea of the sovereignty of God because you're angry about something he allowed to happen to you. And, and maybe today you've even allowed that anger, that bitterness to come between you and your relationship with him. I want to encourage you this morning. He's a God who can be trusted. He's a God who's sovereign. He's a God who will take even the difficult circumstances. I would say especially the difficult circumstances of life and he can use them for our good and for his glory. I don't know if you got this, but when my kids were younger, they often said, it's just not fair, right? And what was the response? Life's not fair, deal with it, right? Such a loving parental response. I'm guilty of saying it, okay? But the next question that that Paul knows is going to come to the forefront is this question of fairness. Is God fair in the way that he treats people? Like if he chooses some and not others, is that really fair? Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Let me stop there for a moment and just say a few things. Number one, do you see how relevant the word of God is today? (laughs) Because we've all asked that same question, haven't we? especially when you talk about election, is that really even fair? How is that fair? But listen to me today. Do not charge charge God with injustice unless you know what he knows. Do not charge God with injustice unless you know what he knows. But there are two things this shows us. Number one, it shows us that Paul is saying exactly what I've been saying he's saying, right? Because otherwise he wouldn't raise the question. Again, he expects the question precisely because of what he's saying. But the second thing we have to see is that if we are asking that question, is God unjust, then we are on the wrong side of the argument. Are you with me today? Like if you're raising the objection to what Paul is saying, you could be on the wrong side of the argument. I love a good debate, but I don't want to debate the Apostle Paul, okay? And so should we even entertain this idea that God is unjust? I love the way John Stott addresses this so well. He says, if therefore God hardens some, he is not being unjust for that is what their sin deserves. If on the other hand he has compassion on some, he is not being unjust, for he is dealing with them in mercy. The wonder is not that some are saved and others are not, but that anybody is saved at all. For we deserve nothing at God's hand but judgment. If we received what we deserved, which is judgment, or we receive what we do not deserve, which is mercy, in neither case is God unjust. If therefore anybody is lost, the blame is theirs, but if anyone is saved, the credit is God's. This antinomy contains a mystery which our present knowledge cannot solve, but it is consistent with scripture, it's consistent with history, and it's consistent with experience. Is God unjust? The answer Paul gives right away is, God forbid. (laughs) No way. Listen, I believe that God is totally fair and his justice is not negated by the doctrine of election. Look at verse 15. He says to Moses, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has what? Who has mercy. This is what it depends on. Honestly, Moses wasn't a very good candidate to deliver God's people. (laughs) 
and, and yet God chose him. Like Moses didn't grow up saying, someday I want to be the deliverer of my people, right? I want, I want to be this great deliverer one day. No, it was God's plan. It was God's purpose that Moses was who he, who he was, right? God chose to show mercy to a man who didn't deserve it. How many of you is that your testimony today? God showed mercy to a man or woman who didn't deserve it. Listen, God doesn't show us mercy because we deserve mercy. It's not because of our will. It's not because of our works. I mean, just look at how he related to Pharaoh. Look at verse 17. For scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up. Here's the purpose, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. What do we know about Pharaoh? We know a lot, right? We've all seen the Prince of Egypt, everybody, right? So we know a lot about his story, right? But two very important things that we need to know and we need to understand that, that Pharaoh was a pagan and he never becomes a believer, right? Ten times he hardened his heart against the Lord. Now, who made Pharaoh the ruler of Egypt? Not a trick question. Who made Pharaoh ruler? God did. All right, thank you. God made him ruler, right? And, and so God sends Moses, and Moses says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, not just one time, but over and over again. And so God uses Pharaoh's stubbornness in order to display his power to the entire world through 10 plagues that would come upon Egypt. Now, I have to ask the question for those of you who saw the prince of Egypt, because you're the only ones who can answer this, right? But you remember that scene where they're, they're going through the Red Sea, the Red Sea parts, and, and they're coming through the Red Sea, and they're just getting to the other side, and, and Pharaoh's army is, is pursuing them, right? And, and at just the right moment, the, the sea comes back into place, and it drowns Pharaoh, it drowns all the Egyptians. When you saw that, did anybody say, oh man, that's not fair? Did anybody say, oh, poor Pharaoh? No. You said, good for him. He getting what he deserves. Now let me ask you, did Moses deserve mercy? No, but he received it anyway. And here's what you can't miss, because this is kind of the main point, if you will. Don't miss what Paul says is the reason behind God's mercy to Moses and his justice to Pharaoh. God's power was put on display. We know that in the story of Exodus. It was put on display so that, here's the reason, his name might be proclaimed in all of the earth. The word proclaimed means to be announced everywhere. That was God's purpose in the story of Exodus. God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. I, I mean, that verse kind of settles it. And it tells us this, that God is completely free to do whatever he wants. Like, you can't take that verse and just cut it out of your Bible. I don't like that verse. No, you have to deal with it. And there are some that will say, well, well Pharaoh hardened his heart first. no. Exodus 4, verse 11, before Moses even stood before Pharaoh, God tells him, I'm going to harden his heart. Here's what I'm going to, I'm going to harden his heart. Listen, if your theology is such that you believe, well, Pharaoh could have said, you know what, I repent. <laughs> and the whole story could have changed, right? If, if, if that's your thinking, well, if Pharaoh had, had, had just repented, then the entire thing would have, story would have changed. The Exodus, no Passover, no great picture of Christ to come. This demonstration of the power of God among the nations. You can't say, well, yeah, maybe God wanted to do all that, but Pharaoh, all he had to do was repent. And everything would have been fine. If that's your thinking, then I have to say that you, the God you believe in is not the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible needs to be defined on the basis of the Bible, not what you like about him. And so the God of the Bible is free to do whatever he wills. And not only is he completely free, but he's also completely fair in the way that he treats each and every person because again, we all deserve God's judgment. And the fact that any one of us receive his mercy. Again, it's nothing short of a miracle. And so what do we do with a passage like this? We're gonna continue in chapter nine next week. But what do we do with a passage like this? Uh, again, many choose to enter into debate over this. It, it, you can understand why some commentators call it the most difficult passage in the Bible. Again, we're not done yet. But I love this passage because Paul's not afraid to raise some of the questions that we raise about God's sovereignty and our responsibility. There's more good questions coming next week. But I also believe this today, that theology should be practical, right? 
And so what do we do with what we've just read? What should we, this understanding do for us? Let me give you a couple things as we prepare to come to the communion table in just a few moments. Number one, let me say this. I believe this doctrine of election should humble us. I think we ought to be completely humble when we understand that, that salvation begins with God's choice. So often we, we talk about free will. We're going to talk more about that next week. But we talk about free will as if it's the most important thing in the world, right? But these verses don't even address it. And hear me today. I, I do believe that the Bible teaches us that we have choices to make, okay? We're going to get into that in chapter 10. But you, you need to know this. Without God choosing us, we would never choose him. And, and this fact, think about it. This fact should, should cause us to come to a place of humility that God calls us to believe even when we don't quite understand it all. Listen to what Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, said. He's, I love this. He says, I, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I am sure he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me. For I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. See, this doctrine ought to bring a humility, right? That same humility should be ours. I can't understand why he would look upon me and why he would choose me, why he would call me out, why he would work in such a way in my life as to change me. But secondly, I think this passage should challenge the way we, we think about our relationship with God because it says what, what you and I already know, that not everyone is going to heaven. It clearly says, man, Isaac's in, Ishmael's out. Jacob's in, Esau's out. Moses is in, Pharaoh, well, we know he's out. But this passage also tells us that our faith is not something that we inherit. Hear me today, just because you grew up in a Christian home doesn't mean you're truly a child of God. And what that means is that no one goes to heaven on the basis of their family background or their nationality or their ethnicity or even their church membership. None of that matters to God. The only thing that matters is knowing Jesus personally. You see, salvation truly begins when you set aside your trust in yourself and your background, whatever you think you bring to the table, you set it aside and you just come humbly to Jesus like a child. Salvation is not about what's fair, it's about mercy. Listen to me today, if you want fair, you get hell. But if you want heaven, you need to rely on the mercy of God. And so then the question becomes, are you gonna trust your own works or are you gonna trust God's mercy? Would you stand with me today? You need to hear this. Some of you need to hear this this morning. If you won't accept God's mercy, someday you will face his judgment. And the only way any of us in this room will ever get to heaven is through the mercy of God. And when we surrender to the work of Christ in our lives, I, I believe these verses are so powerful because they give us an assurance of salvation. We can know this, that the one who has saved us, he's going to bring that work to completion. Knowing that God saves you means this, that he will keep you for all eternity. It was a work of him at the very beginning. And he will complete that work until the end. It's important we understand that as we come to the communion table today. Because it, it means that his mercy cannot be lost because of something we do. If you are in Christ today, know this. God's word cannot fail because he's faithful. And yes, he's fair and he will never let you go. That's the reminder of the Lord's Supper. It's why we're called to do this in remembrance of him. So before we come to the communion table with heads bowed around this room today, I just want you to take a moment. I want you to take a moment and thank him for his mercy in your life. Oh, you may believe that there was something good in you that brought you to this place, but it's only the mercy of God. It's only the mercy of God that he would call you out, that he would choose you. If you're humble enough, you say, I, I don't understand. There's nothing in me that he would choose me. And yet his mercy has come to us. And so before we receive the bread and the cup today, I think we need to just thank him for that mercy. Take a moment where you're at. Just thank him for his mercy in your life. 
Hallelujah. If you haven't already received it, receive that. No, it is a gift that's available to you again. Again, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Maybe today you just need to make that confession of faith for the very first time. Can't help but think that maybe there's someone in the room think you're good because you, you grew up in a Christian household, so I'm good. And yet God's calling you. He's drawing you. There's not just an outward call. There's an internal call right now. God's drawing you to himself. Respond. Respond to that. Respond to that right now. Come on, just begin to thank him. Church, let's lift up our voices and thank him for his mercy and, and his grace in our lives before we receive the bread, before we receive the cup.